<laughs> Pastor, again, Pastor Larry, he is, uh, he is not here today and asked me to fill in, and I always appreciate the opportunity to be able to fill in. And uh, um, not that I was wishing on bad weather, nothing like that, but uh, having a, a more intimate, smaller crowd helps my heart a little bit and uh, helps me not be as nervous or maybe it does. I don't know. Maybe it's way more nervous. But just thank you uh, for the opportunity to be able to fill in. A lover pastor. He is such a godly man. And uh, he loves Jesus. And he loves the Word of God. And so to be able to, uh, to stand here and, uh, and, and to present the Word of God, it's a scary thing. Uh, especially uh, all of us being under such an incredible teacher. He's such a blessed man. And uh, we're just thankful for him. Um, if you will, turn in your Bibles to Colossians. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it was appropriate to say that uh, uh, with Colossians, that is what the discipleship groups are going to be teaching. We're going to be teaching the book of Colossians. And so I thought how appropriate it would be to actually kind of do a little bit of an overview of Colossians as just like uh, promoting our discipleship groups next month. And... I want to focus on two uh, key verses here, okay? And so, Annie, if you want to follow along, here's two key verses. It's Colossians chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, Colossians chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. Colossians 1, 27 and 28. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of His glory, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That maturity in Christ was Paul's main focus, really, in writing to the, to the church at Colossae, to the people of Colossians. And he wanted to make known the supremacy of Christ, the all-greatness, the all-powerful and creator of, uh, of Jesus Christ uh, being God himself, and also presenting people in their maturity. And uh, before we start, let's just have another quick word of prayer. Ask God to bless this. Lord Jesus, bless this time that we have together. May you receive the glory for it. Lord, be my words, be the word, and may people hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not smart to preach with gum in your mouth, so it won't. Um, I heard, uh, I was watching TV last week, and I saw a, a, a pastor's wife. And it was funny because it was like on one of those morning shows. And they, they showed a little clip, and they said, we're going to show you a little clip of a pastor's wife and, and what she was saying about the flu epidemic. So I know a lot of people in the church have been sick. Some of y'all have had the flu. Some of you might still have the flu. Some people are probably home with the flu. And the pastor's wife at this, uh, it's a famous pastor. But anyway, she was on TV, and this is what she basically said. Don't go get a flu shot. You don't have to get a flu shot. Because if you have faith, you can just say, I'm not going to get the flu. And just keep repeating that to yourself. I'm not going to get the flu. I'm not going to get the flu. And have faith that you're not going to get the flu. You won't get the flu. Then it pans back over to this, you know, like the morning show people. And knowing some of the personalities, you know, some of them, of these morning show personalities, I know at least one or two may have professed their faith in Christ. And they said, so what she's saying is if you don't have if you lack faith, you're going to get the flu, basically. It's like, so if you get the flu, it's because you're, you didn't have enough faith. That's what they took out of it. And it's funny because that's probably what the world took out of it too. Now, can we overcome things with faith? Yes. Faith without works is dead. Yes, James, that's what pastor's been preaching out of on Wednesday night about faith in Jesus. But it's not just faith. There, there are works that go along with that. But it is faith in Jesus alone that saves us, right? And because of the faith in Christ and what he's done, then we do works. Well, it got me thinking because Colossians is such a perfect book that kind of battles bad theology and good theology. So this is my approach today. 
I would like to approach y'all like I would teach the youth on a Sunday morning. I, I, I'm given the opportunity that most Sunday mornings uh, I teach our youth. And, and I thought, this is kind of how I would do this. It would probably be a two-part if I was in the youth group, but for you guys it'll be a one-part. In the youth we have like 10 minutes, so, uh, so y'all, you know, bear with me. So here's what I would like to do. I'm going to give you some information about why Paul wrote this letter to the church uh, in Colossae, to the Colossians. And one of the things that he's going to do is he's going to present proper theology and following that there's going to be practical theology. Okay, proper theology. Proper theology, uh, it means just God, theos is God, ology is the study of. And so, you know, some of y'all might be, uh, have taken biology in class, right? You're like, oh, that's the study of stuff. I don't even know, you know. I just remember cutting the frog open and the formaldehyde smell. That's what I remember about biology class. But theology, theos, God, ology, the study of, we're studying God. Who is God? What is he made of? Who is he? What's his characteristics? You know, what's his attributes? Trying to know and understand as much as possible about God as we can. Theology. And then there's practical theology. It's just like day-to-day -day living things. You know, how can I take God's Word and apply it to my life? And I guarantee most of the pastors that if you flip in through the channels or you watch YouTube videos, most of them are practical theology. It's just how to live day-to-day-to-day. -to -day -to -day. You know, they don't emphasize necessarily the attributes of God, the characteristics of God as much as they do. This is how you're supposed to live your life. And so Paul, when he wrote this book of Colossians, he gives both. And so it's, uh, I thought, let's, let's check it out. Let's see how he does that. So Psalms 46.10, and it's up, on the, uh, up there. It says, be still and know that I am God. Be still. That's a hard thing to do. Right? Even if you're driving in your car, radio's on. You know, if you're sitting at your house, a lot of times, you know, you have your phone or TV or whatever. There's something, a lot of times, I'd say for most of us, I just glanced at Andy and I know he's a hardworking man. So, probably doesn't spend too much time on the, the computer-y, you know, stuff. But I would say for, for most people, there's a lot of distracting things. But when it says, be still and know that I am God, that word know is yada. It's a, it's a Hebrew word. Pastor's gone over it before. It's, it's the idea of this. When Adam knew Eve, she conceived. She got pregnant. Right? He knew her. He knew the most intimate things about her. He knew her, uh, uh, you know, her personality and her character and what the things that she liked or didn't. or You know, it's like... He just knew everything about Eve, but also it just says that he knew Eve and she conceived. Well, the idea of like being still and know that I am God, the idea is like be still and figure out who God is. Who is he in Scripture? What does the Bible say? What does his word say? Who does the, you know, who, who is it that we're reading about? And the Bible is full of, of, uh, of revealing this mystery of who God is, who He is. Do we understand it all? No, we don't. And I don't think we ever will till we get into heaven. But Now, it's God as a spirit, as a person, uh, in His life. He's self-existent, His attributes. He's eternal, unchangeable. Now, and then how does this apply to me? In the book of Colossians, just to kind of give you an overview, Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul. It was written around 60 or 62 AD. You can go to the next slide. Written to the church in Colossae. It's now a, a part of a modern-day Turkey. If you look at, you know, that's where Colossae uh, was. It used to be a really popular area that was traveled through um, back in the, I think, before the first century. Um, and then um, uh, Laodicea became like the next, like y'all heard in Revelation, like there's a church, Laodicea. Well, at first it was Colossae, and it was a big traveling route. And a lot of travelers would go through, and it was very popular. And then the Roman Empire kind of took over and made it one of its provinces. And uh, at the time, in 60 or 62 AD, when Paul wrote this, Nero, who was the emperor of Rome, he was ruling and was a terrible... I mean, you talk about persecution of the Christians, we're talking Nero, okay? 
And one of the reasons why Paul wrote this letter in the first place was to uh, refute bad theology. One of, the, one of the ideas, by the time he wrote the book of Colossians, Colossae was not near as popular as Laodicea. Actually, it was one of like, just, you know, a, a small town. You know, like Swartz Creek, you know, everybody knows where Flint is, right? Flint, Michigan. You heard of Flint? Yeah, we're on the top three of the most dangerous places to live. Come on, guys, you know, bring a suitcase, and you know. But, uh, and then you tell people, like, where do you live? And you go, Swartz Creek, and they're like, where's that? And you go, Flint, and they're like, I know where Flint's at, you know. Or better yet, Detroit. Do you know where Detroit's at? Well, Colossae used to be one of those big-name cities, and then all of a sudden it's just kind of like, eh, you know, Swartz Creek. You know, it's there, but it's not as popular. And so Paul takes, he, out of all the letters that he writes, he, he takes time and God presses his heart to write this letter to this city that's just, at the time, it's not that popular. And why would he do that? And the main reason why Paul would do that is because the information that this church was getting that was, that was full of Jews and Gentiles, they had bad theology. And Paul wanted to refute that. And one of the main theological problems or one of the main beliefs that they had at the time was called Gnosticism. And I got it up there on the board, Gnosticism. And the whole idea is matter or whatever is, you know, made up of matter, whether your body or your skin or the earth, you know, the, the universe is evil. And the whole idea or the premise from this is they believe that that God produced these other divine spirits that he would release off himself. This is Gnosticism, okay? And then those spirits that he would, you know, divine beings that he would release off himself would also release spirits off themselves and then spirits off those things and on and on and on until finally there was one, you know, spiritual being that had no recollection and did not comprehend who God was in, at all, even though it originated from God. This is Gnosticism. And that one spirit created the universe. And since it didn't comprehend God or understand God or know who God was, it was evil. And all the things, the matter that that thing produced was evil, except the spirit. So the matter itself is evil. The spirit is good. So your body, this is what they believe, the body, the physical body is evil, but your soul is good. And the way that they would, uh, I don't, the way that they would kind of like react to that is they would, uh, they would either do two things. They would abuse the body as much as possible, you know, like whipping themselves or maybe even severing a digit or whatever. You know, it, it was like they would abuse their bodies or they would just say, since the body is separated from the spirit, we'll just let it give in whatever the body wants, the body can have, and it's totally separated. It won't be sinful. So if the body desired anything, fill in the blank, they would let the body have that because it's separated anyway from the spirit. The spirit's good, the body's evil. Let the body do evil. That, that was kind of their mindset. And so here comes, here comes Paul, and he wants to say, no, 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 we're going to refute some things. And so y'all can look in Colossians 1, Colossians 1, 5. And so here's how Paul, he's, he's starting off Colossians, and he's like, Paul, he says, 1, 5. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, is this you've heard, uh, of this you have heard before in the word, the truth and the gospel. In verse 6, and it's come to you indeed in the whole world. It's bearing fruit. It's growing. In verse 7, just as you have learned from, from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister in Christ on your behalf, and he's made known to us the love of your spirit. And then it goes on to say that, uh, verse 11, may you be strengthened with all power. Uh, giving a glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks, verse 12, to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. And so in Colossians 1, he is mentioning, he's mentioning Jesus Christ. And then he's mentioning the Holy Spirit. May you be filled with the knowledge of His will. 
and in His Spirit. And then He mentions the Father in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father. So he, He's already mentioning Jesus as the Son and the Spirit of God and God as Father. And so what he's done, even in just those first few verses, is he's saying, this is the triune God that we worship. This is Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, and they are one. And so as he's writing to this, he's saying, no, 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 I don't know what your beliefs are that you've brought in here, but we're going to just kill that right now. Verse 14. If y'all look at verse 14, in whom we've had redemption. He is the redeemer of our souls. He's the forgiver of our sins. In verse 16, in verse 16, he says, he says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So he's the creator. He's omniscient. He's all-powerful. Verse 17, he's eternal, and he's everywhere all the time at any time. He's omnipresent. In verse 19, and in Colossians 2, uh, 2 through 14, God is incarnate. And it talks about the fullness of Christ, the full supremacy of Christ, that you could see him, you could hear him, you could touch him. One of the things that Gnosticism would say is Jesus was just a spirit. And that if he was walking on the beach, he would leave no footprints. If you tried to touch Jesus while he was on earth, your hand would pass through his body. And what Paul was saying was, no, there were disciples who were with him, and they touched him, and they heard him, and they saw him. And, and you know, it's like if Jesus grabbed them by the shoulder to tell them something, they felt it, you know. And when Thomas, when he touched his hand and when he touched his side, it was real. And so Paul was refuting that, saying Jesus had a body. And, and he, yet, at the same time, it was the fullness of God on earth. That is theology proper. That is learning about who God is and His attributes and what He is and what's he, what He's about. That is, that is uh, the, the idea of studying God for whom He is. Who is Jesus? He is God. So theology proper. Now, if we turn over to Colossians 3, we get into the practical theology. This is one of the things that stuck out to me because it was saying like, um, here's a list of things to do. And I read that list of things like, stay away from this and do these things. Don't do this, do this. And I thought, well, that's kind of, you know, where's the grace in that, right? Like, it sounds like a bunch of laws from the Old Testament. But at the same time, I thought, why would they write kind of some do's and don'ts where is this coming from? Well, where it's coming from is look at who Jesus is. Look at what God has done in Jesus. Look at how he has forgiven us. And now look at some proper responses. And the proper responses is the practical theology. Look at Colossians 3, 1 through 4. The idea in that is set your mind on Christ. Set your mind. See the bigger picture. See the bigger picture of why God created you in the first place. If you've been raised from Christ, then seek the things that are above, where Christ is. That's Colossians 3.1. If you've been raised with Him, you were raised with Him, you were buried with Him when He died. If you're in Christ, you are these things. But the cool part is, if you were raised with Him, that means that you have an eternal life. Like, the body is a shell, right? It's not separated from the Spirit, Necessarily not right now. You know, so we can't just let the body do whatever the body wants. But he's saying, set your mind on Christ. See the big picture. Colossians 3, 5 through 9. Put away. Put away, colon, all right? Here's a list of things to, you know, stay away from. Put away sexual immorality, impurity, impure thoughts, passions, evil desires, covetousness, anger, wrath, malice, slander, talking behind people's backs uh, for the purpose to cut them down and to make them less than. Obscene talk or lies, lying to one another. And then in Colossians 3.12, it says, put on, 
So here's some more practical things that Paul's saying. Put on a compassionate heart. Put on kindness. Put on humility or meekness or patience. Helping each other, forgiving each other, bringing peace to one another. Put on these things. Put away those other things. Put on these things. Practical theology. Now, I would say in, in a lot of churches today, this is what they would focus on. Hey, guys, quit being sexually immoral. Don't have impure thoughts. Quit coveting other people's things. Quit wanting what everybody else has. You know, are you angry? Do you have a problem with anger? Well, you need to stop it. Okay? Do you have a problem talking about people? You need to stop that. You're going, but how? How do I stop those things? Well, you just need to do better. You know, let your will, you can overcome these things. You just need to fight it. Right? It's good advice. But you've got to understand who is your audience. And, that, and I think that's what Paul's purpose was because he understood good theology. Now, Paul's letter, in the, in the next slide, here's Paul's letter. He's writing and he's saying, I'm going to refute bad theology. I'm going to promote two things. He goes, I'm going to promote Christian liberty, freedom in Christ. Amen. Thank you so much. We don't have to live under the law, right? And sanctification. Sanctification is just being set apart to be made holy. You are set apart and you are made holy when you are saved, when you become a Christian. However, do you still sin? I see that hand. I know nobody else can see out there. Right? We'll just say that. I see that hand and I see that hand. Yes, we have our struggles. We have things that, that you know, the days get the best of us. And our attitudes aren't right. And we say the wrong thing. We do the wrong thing. Well, sanctification, it's a daily process of being made holy. It's a continual process. And you know when it's made complete and perfect? When you meet Jesus face to face in heaven. But until then, we have been sanctified and we are being sanctified daily. And then on three, Paul's purpose, he's exalting Christ as the ultimate supremacy. And then he's applying this practically that we talked about so that we can be mature Christians. And I want to just kind of like give an idea of uh, the, the Paul refuting bad theology, okay? When I was in Bible, uh, Bible school, uh, we went through a book called Systematic Theology. And it's a lot of ologies, okay? And so the next slide, there's Bibliology. Now, poor... Bibliology is just picking up the Bible, and then what you would say is, this is good. I don't understand half of it. There's a few things in here that I do get, but there's some pretty cool stuff to live by, and I'm just going to read the things that I understand, and I'm going to leave alone the things that I don't. Because, you know, it's a lot. There's a lot in this Bible. That's bad theology. You just kind of pick and choose a few things, and you apply it to your life and go, I'm good. Bad theology, bibliology. Well, bibliology, what this was saying in, in, a, in a correct form would say it's the revelation, inspiration, and inerrancy of the Bible. It's accurate. It's reliable. It's authoritative. This is the Word of God. It's a copy. It's still inerrantly authoritative, the Word of God. It was written over 1,500 years, over 40 different authors, and they're all coming back with the same message of saying God loved you so much that He gave away to be saved through the blood of His Son, redemption, forgiveness, love. I mean, all these guys were writing in the same thing, and it's like you, you might read some, some stories and you go, well, I don't understand that too much. But the holistic part of it is, is the entire story, it, it joins together in a complete puzzle, and it does make sense. That's kind of what I'm intrigued about, especially for some of the Jews who became Christians in the first century. They knew the Old Testament, and they knew the law. But when Christ, even when He met with His, with his disciples, and He started explaining the Scriptures to them, they started putting it together, saying, oh, the one prophesied about, the Messiah to come, that's Jesus. 
And so they start putting these puzzle pieces together. And I can't imagine like in the 4th or 5th century when they get like the canons and they get all the books of the Bible and they put them together and they pray through it and they say, this, this is the complete Word of God in full. And they can see the Old Testament. And they can see the New Testament. And they can look in the Old Testament and go, look at all the laws. Nobody could live by that. People were too sinful. They need a Savior. Look, here's Jesus. Jesus the Messiah came. He forgave them of their sins. He put it together. He became the law. He became the fullness of all God and all Scripture. And He lived it out perfectly. And in Christ, having faith in Christ, you can have that life too. And then it goes on to say, this is how it'll end. I mean, you know, you go to the last chapter and it's like, new heaven, new earth, it's going to end. But for us, for the ones who are, who are Christians, it will continue and continue and continue in Jesus Christ. There's a hope. And so Paul, he's saying, bibliology, there's correct part of having the Bible, having the Word. Ecclesiology is the church. If you have a bad idea of the church, it means that these four walls right here is the church. That's bad theology. Bad, having bad ecclesiology, a study of the church. But the church is a people. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about how there are many members in the body of Christ. The many members are Christians. And some are hands and some are feet. And He's given us all like different gifts and, uh, and gifts and talents that we can use and serve in the church, being the body of Christ. And Jesus is the head. And so we are in union with Jesus Christ, serving together and, and giving glory in our lives and, and through the things that we do and say for the glory of Jesus. That's good theology. And um, hamartiology is about sin. Uh, the hamar just means like, you know, sin or falling short of the mark. And so there's this idea of bad theology with sin. Are you a sick person or are you a dead person? A sick person, you could get a couple of shots and take a couple of pills and maybe be better, all right? You got the flu and you just need some flu meds. Tamiflu and you're all good in a few weeks, right? It's been going around. A dead person needs somebody to save their life, to breathe life into them. And the idea of bad theology just says you're sick. That's it. So you need not to be sick. You need to open your eyes and you need to see what Jesus has done for you. That's, that's what you need to do. You just need to wake up and see what Jesus did. And you're like, how can I wake up if I'm dead? Correct theology in original sin says that when sin happened through Adam in the beginning... It imputed sin to everyone from then on. The imputation of sin. Every cell, every blood vessel, every bone, every thought, every muscle and tendon, you know, however many layers there are in your skin, it's all imputed with sin to the core of who you are and what you are. And it has killed you. And so you need somebody to give you life. And that's why Ephesians 2.1 says, You once were dead in your sin. But then you go into Ephesians 2.5. It says, But now you are alive in Christ. Christ is the one who has breathed into us and taken away the imputation of sin and clothed us with His righteousness so that when God the Father sees us, he sees the blood of Jesus. He sees the righteousness. That's correct theology when it comes to sin. And so Paul, he's writing this and he's saying, we need to address a few of these things because if you have bad theology in this, then what you're doing is you're serving God so that He will love you more. You ever done things and go, man, if I just do... These three things, I think God is going to give me more love. I think He might give me more grace. I think He might love me more. Maybe God might be kinder to me if I just do these few things. I've thought that before. 
I thought if I just do these things and I don't do these things, then God will love me. That happened to Martin Luther before the Reformation. He just thought if I do these things and if I abuse my body so much and if I go to confession enough, maybe God might love me more and save me. And when he finally got a hold of the Word, the true Word of God, it completely changed him. He got a hold of the Word and he read about the love of, of Jesus and he read about like that original sin and what Jesus Christ already did for him. And he was free. Christian liberty. Liberty in, in Christ. Sanctification. Being made holy. Being set apart. And so he wrote a few things to the church and that's whenever he nailed it to the door and the Reformation started. Saying, in Jesus you can live. You have freedom in Christ. You can live life to the fullest. And then the practical theology comes out of this. Colossians 3.14, be thankful. Colossians 3.16 and 17, take in God's Word, the Bible, for teaching and correcting each other. And then what do we do out of that? What do we do after we learn that God has taken our sin and He's covered us with His righteousness? It says that we will sing songs of thankfulness. We will serve God. We're working for God, serving God in love. And then it goes on to say in Colossians 3.18, husbands and wives. I know that it says like wives submit, husbands love. We've already been, I've preached that. You can go back and, and, and uh, check out some of those sermons about that. But here's the idea. When two people are married, it should be the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The husbands are loving the wives as Christ loved the church, Ephesians 5. And it said that Christ gave his life for it. And it's saying husbands, Love your wives that much. And you know how they'll respond? They will love you. That's just, that's in the Bible. And I pray that that happens in, in marriages. But the idea is for the man and the woman is to be joined together and Christ is joined to them in this mysterious union, but it's portraying the gospel. And it's an amazing portrayal of the gospel of Jesus. The saying just like this, you know, just unlimited amount of love and forgiveness because husbands I guarantee you probably messed up this week right and you need your wife to forgive you so there you go you, you know show some forgiveness and you're seeing how Christ forgives you right and then Colossians 4 5 and 6 speech and conversations it talks about when we talk with people let your speech and your conversations be seasoned with salt full of grace Cool thing about salt. Salt used back in the olden days was as a, it was, you know, a preservative. It would preserve meat. And so, you know, if you killed a hog, you would cut the hog up and you would put it in like jars of salt and it would preserve that meat. And so it, you know, it would help that meat last longer, maybe through the winter because they didn't necessarily have electricity or refrigerators or anything like that. So they needed a way to preserve things to eat. That's what salt did. And it's kind of neat when he says, let your conversations be seasoned with salt. Let your conversations preserve people. You know, hide people's sin. Not tear them down publicly like that. You know, build them up. It's a cool way to say that. Full of grace. Giving grace to people. <clears throat> And I'll close with this. We'll say, we see how Paul, he, he uplifted the supremacy of Jesus Christ in Scripture. Therefore, we put away sexual immorality, impurity, slander, malice. We put on a kind and gentle heart. We put on service to God, forgiving each other, helping each other because of what Jesus did in the first place. Not so that Christ will love us more. How can He love us any, any more than He already has? He's given us everything. He's saying, since Jesus did that, of course you'll want to serve Him. Of course you'll want to love Him. Of course you'll, you'll want to be part of the family of God, part of the church, and sing songs, and lift each other up, 
and build each other up in conversation and in, in, in helping each other. Of course. We close with Romans 2.4. And I got the New Living Translation. I love the way that this is said. I got it up on the board. It says, Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? I read that and I was like, Yep. <laughs> it was a, a good old yep, a southern yep. Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Yes. Yes, we do. Does this mean nothing to you? Do you take that for granted? Do I take that for granted? Can't you see His kindness is intended to turn you from sin? Can't you see that His kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? His kindness leads us to repentance. His favor, His grace that He has given us. It leads us to live a life that's practical. Practical living. Good theology should lead to practical living. Practical theology. That's the idea that Paul had. He wanted the church to know that and he wanted us to know that. That if we lift up Jesus, which I love how Pastor Larry does this. He takes scripture and he brings out the fullness of who Jesus Christ is in those scriptures. And then the practical living, it should come naturally. It should happen. Especially if we're surrounding ourselves with people who have different strengths and weaknesses than we do. I used to be redheaded. And uh, a short temper, have you ever heard that? Redheads have short tempers? It's kind of true, you know. It's very true. But you know what's awesome about this? Is that some of the people and some of my friends and some of the church family that I have within you guys, when I hang out with y'all, it helps that. It helps me to calm down. And I'm sure that y'all can think of things too that you can say, these are some of my weaknesses, but within my church family, if I'm hanging out with them, it helps me. Practically, practical day-to-day -day living comes from awesome, good, correct theology. So thank you, Paul, for that letter. And uh, thank you, Lord, for this message. And I pray that it changes our lives. Help us to, to read Scripture, to see who God is and who Jesus is in those Scripture, and then to see how we can apply it to our life. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much, God, for today. Lord, I pray that people heard Jesus. People didn't hear me. Lord, uh, um, I pray that you would receive glory, Lord. Help us to understand that, Lord, in you... And Jesus is the fullness of God. And if we have Jesus in our life, then we have the fullness of God in our lives. We have life, and we have breath, and we have movement, and we have service, and we have gifts, and we have talents, and we have speech that can lift people up. Help it to be seasoned with salt and full of grace. And God, help us in our day-to-day -day life live a life that reflects who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.